Your original state, as we have been talking, is divine. That is your real personality. And this state of divinity, of eternal bliss, is a state that is referred to as paripurna. Paripurna means total fulfillment. It's a sense of completeness. Now, why that term is given is because what we experience is the opposite of Paripurna. We feel a sense of incompleteness, unfulfillment, which is imaginary. Your essential being is full, complete. But since we are ignorant of the state, since we do not know our original state, our true value, there is a sense of void, a sense of incompleteness that is felt at any stage. Now, you may justify and say, Look, I feel incomplete because I have to achieve certain things in life. And I believe that once I achieve it, I will feel fulfilled. But this feeling keeps on shifting. This is what we see in an average human being's life. So you fulfill certain desires, you feel satisfied, but then you feel again the need to satisfy more desires, and this is never ending. It never stops. So we say, you are going through this feeling of emptiness, a void, a need to fulfill yourself because you have not reached your original state. And what prevents you from getting back to your original state is nothing but desire. And every human is nothing but a manifestation of desires. Every human. You are nothing but what your desires are. So you have a choice. Now if you've seen Lord Krishna, he has a stick in one hand as a cowherd boy taking the cows for grazing and bringing them back in the evening every morning you know a cowherd boy would take the cattle for grazing and bring back the cattle in the evening so this is represented by krishna having a stick in one hand and a jnana mudra you understand a jnana mudra this is a jnana mudra as a jnana mudra in the other hand. So it is a message for us, for anyone, that in life you have this choice. The choice is the stick which a cowherd boy uses to take the cattle for grazing every morning the cattle graze all day long, feed themselves all day long. And the cowherd boy uses the stick to gather the cattle and bring it back at night. Now, what does this represent? Our five senses, Krishna, first of all, represents your essential being, that pure consciousness 
that pure awareness with which you are functioning in the world. You all know that you have a physical body, mind and intellect. But the question is, how does the body act? What enables the body to act? As you know, body is nothing but matter. And matter by itself has no light. I'm sorry, life. It has no life. But you are an expression of life. How does the body come to life? What enables the body to function? So there is something beyond the body enabling it to function. Similarly, your mind has feelings. What enables your mind to feel emotions, positive or negative, irrespective? But there is something that enables your mind to feel. What is that? Something beyond the mind enables the mind to feel. Similarly, you are able to think right now. You are trying to understand. Your intellect is trying to grasp what is being said. What is enabling that instrument to function? So whether it's your body, mind or intellect, by itself, all three are nothing but matter. Body is gross matter, mind and intellect, together are subtle matter but they're all matter and matter by itself has no life yet you are a dynamic expression of life what makes you come to life it is that pure consciousness that pure consciousness functioning through you enables you to come to life just as this bulb is giving out light the bulb by itself has no light. When you purchase the bulb, there is no light. It has an external case and a filament inside. Everything is intact. Yet, there is no expression of light. Only when the bulb is in contact with electricity, you will find an expression of light. Similarly, you have a physical body, mind and intellect, but none of these will come to life unless there is an enlivening principle. What is that enlivening principle? That is your true nature. That is that pure consciousness with which your body is conscious of perceptions, sights, sounds, smell, taste, touch. These are the perceptions and the body is able to act at the physical level. Mental level, your mind is able to feel. Intellectually, you're able to think, reason, understand, rightly or wrongly, but that function is there. That which enables your body, mind and intellect to function is that pure consciousness represented by Lord Krishna. So this pure consciousness is within you. That is your real personality. We've already seen that. The body, mind, and intellect. The body is your outer personality. Mind and intellect is your inner personality. But the self in you, the God principle in you, the enlivening principle, pure consciousness, is your real personality. Now, coming back to the choice, you could use this pure consciousness in you, that enlivening principle in you, that self in you, the Atman in you, you could use that as the cowherd boy uses the stick, which means take your senses, mind and intellect into the world and graze all day long, collecting sights, sounds, smell, taste, touch, feelings, thinking, ideas, collect them all through the day and come back at night to do what? Cattle have a unique capacity and that is they cut chew. You understand cut chewing? Whatever they have eaten, the whole day, they bring it back into the mouth and keep on chewing. This is called cud chewing. 
Only cattle do that. So we also, in a way, we go out into the world, contact the world, gain experiences in the world by virtue of the fact that there is an enlivening principle enabling the body, mind, and intellect to gather experiences. And even after the experiences are over, we only get back to relive them, rethink, go back to that enjoyment and experience over and over again. So what will happen to people who engage themselves in this manner in life is you remain in this world. Nothing beyond it. So you only live in this world to acquire and enjoy. The world of objects, emotions and thoughts. This you could do your whole life, choice. Or you could follow the Jnana Mudra using the same living principle, the same pure consciousness which is available to you. You could use it not to lose yourself in this world, gathering experiences, remembering these experiences, and wanting to have more and more such experiences. Instead of that, you disconnect from the physical body, mind, and intellect. When we say disconnect, don't get worried. You can, you're not cutting off anything. We go back to the karma bhakti jnana. You use this body, mind, and intellect not to get lost in the world, but to achieve something higher. So the pointing finger represents your ego. So your individuality, instead of associating with the body, mind, and intellect, and you become conscious of yourself as this person, you use these equipments and your individuality, you surrender to the self in you, represented by the thumb. Why the thumb? Because it's the most important part of your hand. So even if you miss one of these fingers, you can manage to use your hand. But if you don't have the thumb, it's far more difficult, almost impossible, to carry on with your normal activities. So the thumb being the most important part of your hand represents the self. So your ego surrenders to the self in you, the God principle in you, by which it forms a circle. A circle has no beginning, no end. So you become that infinite principle, that infinite truth, if you surrender your individuality to that pure consciousness in you. So you could use your time here. You could use your life here not just to go into the world represented by the stick, graze the whole life and come back only to relive your experiences and continue the same way. Instead, you use your physical body, mind and intellect and the ego to get back to your original state and reach that div divine core, which is your true mission in this world. So now, what is it that takes us away from this mission in life is your desire. And that is why in all religions, desire is personified as the devil standing between human and God. Human minus desire equals God. A human being plus, I'm sorry, God plus desire equals a human. So desire is personified as the devil. Uh, here you have it. In Christianity as Satan, Islam as Shaitan, Buddhism, Mara, Hinduism, Asura. Desire is personified as the devil, the terrible personality that keeps you away from your original state. So what is the Bhagavad Gita telling us? What are all the scriptures telling us? Just this, 
that do not allow these desires to rule your life. Because if you permit that, you are going away from your own self. And that is why what we concluded yesterday, the 64th and 65th verses are of prime importance in your life. And those who are really keen to understand more, you will have to get back to the book Vedanta Treatise. He explains there what is renunciation, what is leading this life that we're talking about, of life free from being tossed around by your desires. And he says, you don't have to give up anything. It's not what you do in life that matters, but how you do it, why you do it. So you can be in the midst of objects. You can be in the midst of your work, in the world. You can enjoy as much as you want. There is no restriction whatsoever. Then you wonder, what is this life of renunciation? What is the life of self-control? The two disciplines that we said yesterday. One is, let not your likes and dislikes guide your actions. Why do you act? I like to do it. Why are you not doing it? Because I don't like it. If you do that, you will only develop more desires. And then you are drawn away, which is what we are going to be studying. If, on the other hand, you choose your actions according to what you understand as right, if you do that, it's not easy. It may sound easy. It will take a lifetime for you to master. Every moment, every action, why are you doing it? It must have a higher cause. You're talking to someone. Why are you talking unnecessarily? Check. Because it's your life. Remember we said you can choose your actions. Nobody can stop you. But there is a consequence for every action that you perform. When it comes to consequence, you can't change. So you will have to choose your actions according to what you want to achieve. So if you're using your intellect rather than likes and dislikes, that's the first aspect of self-control. Thereafter, you can do what you want. You can go where you want. There's no problem about that. But let not your likes and dislikes decide what you are doing. What must decide? Your higher understanding of life, your intellect. And then the second part, which many people don't realize, is having enjoyed, you know, when the perception reaches the sense center in your mind, the experience is complete. Your enjoyment is complete. If it doesn't reach, take a look at the screen again, just to revise what we studied yesterday. Remember, this is the mind. And you have sense centers, C1, C2, C3, C4, and C5. These are the sense centers. They correspond to each sense that you have eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and skin. So the objects of the world in the form of, what are the objects for the senses? For the eye, it is sight. Ears, sound. Nose, smell. Tongue, taste. Skin, touch. That's it, as simple as that. For the mind, it's feelings. For the intellect, it's ideas. That's all. So these are the ways by which the world enters you. Now once it enters you and meets the sense center in the mind, it's registered in the mind, your experience is complete. You say, oh, lovely food, the taste is complete. Lovely sight, sight is complete. You enjoy. So far, you have not violated self-control at all. But the moment you start reliving it, why not we have this again? When can I have this again? How can I have this again? The plan starts. 
I've also cautioned you, if it is an intellectual decision that this is something that is necessary, this is something that we need, it is still the intellect, you have not violated. But the mind has a tendency to relive the experience, relive the enjoyment aimlessly, indiscriminately, for no reason. Because you like it. Or to avoid it because you dislike it. Unnecessary thought flow sets in. That violates self-control. So that reliving that experience will create further desires in your own mind. And if you do that, you flout the very discipline of self-control. So now these two put together will bring peace of mind. You enjoy fully and you're peaceful. You're never agitated because there's no further plans. There's no disappointment. There is no expectation to get something more. Your perception must end with perception. Your experience must end with experience. If you can maintain that, you are maintaining self-control. And then he said, when your mind is peaceful, your intellect becomes sharp. When your intellect becomes sharp, it's available to you to perform right actions. You become successful. So thus, like two pedals to the wheel, you find that the intellect brings in that self-control. You get peace of mind. And with peace of mind, you are, your, your intellect is sharp. And you find that you're able to be effective in the world. The two things that everybody is looking for, peace and success, is achieved. That's where we concluded yesterday, and we carry on with the 66th verse. Nasti buddhira yuktasya na cha yuktasya bhavana na cha bhavayata shantihi ashantasya kutasukham There is neither knowledge nor meditation for the unsteady and to the unmeditative. There is no peace to the peaceless. How can there be happiness? Now, in con it's almost he is drawing a conclusion. So first of all, in the 61st verse, he said, control the senses. You must control. That's the first thing you need to do, first discipline. Without that, you cannot progress on this path. You cannot, if you say, look, I'm not interested in a path, you cannot be peaceful. You're interested in peace. So you cannot find peace unless you control. Start with the senses, 61. If you don't, 62 and 63, he gave us the ladder of fall. What will happen? There will be complete destruction. You will not be able to continue in life. It's a matter of time. You'll be agitated. That's what he was talking about. Then he gave us the mechanism, 64 followed by 65. You have peace and success. Both are there. So if you choose not to follow this, you are an ayuktaha. Ayukta is one who is not self-controlled. Now what happens to an ayukta, an uncontrolled person, loses knowledge. Remember we gave the example, there could be a doctor, a well-known doctor. He's able, to, he's got a good practice, everything is going fine. But what happens? He himself is a victim. He, he can't give up smoking. He can't give up drinking. So slowly it's eating him up. It's a question of time. He's slowly destroying himself unnecessarily. So if you are a victim, it is because you have not led a life of self-control. And self-control in the way we have described it. I've been cautioning you, please do not equate self-control to self-denial. Like the New Year's round the corner, I must give up this. I know I've done this wrong, so I should not do this again. If you try that, you will only get frustrated. You'll be suppressed, you'll be repressed. 
It cannot be done mechanically. First of all, you got to have some ideal, some goal to achieve. Why are you doing it? If you have a goal, then your whole personality cooperates to achieve that goal. It is an intelligent regulation of your activities according to yourself. Nobody else is telling you. You will have the strength to do it. So, a yuktaha, a person who is self-controlled, has a fixation, has some higher purpose. We gave the example of a young man who wants to become proficient in tennis. He's a young person. He's got friends. He's got activities that he would normally have gone for. He's got uh, movies to go to or parties to attend. So many things. He is able to control all those activities. Why? Because he's fired by an ideal. I must become proficient in this game. The moment he has that, he's, he's got the strength the inner strength to handle any temptation, any invitation, any distraction, which he normally would have entertained. So if you say, you know, I'd like to come for this study and I want to learn these things, but what to do? Commitments. It only means, people come and say that, I don't have the time. When you say you don't have the time, you're only saying, look, this study is not my priority. It, that's what it means. What is your priority? Party going, merry making, holidays. Because you have time to do all that. From where did it come? That same time. This is not important to you. That's what it means. And it is not important to you because you have no goal. There's no fixation. The moment you know this is something vital in life, there's a fixation. Like the young man says, I must be proficient. I've got to master this game. It's a goal. The moment he sets the goal, all his activities are directed to achievement of the goal. Such a person is a yuktaha, self-controlled. A yukta is when you have no purpose. Just, uh, it's good to attend Gita class. Let us go. Five evenings. Anyway, these days, no new movies. No music program. And at home also, children are not there. I have nothing to do. I'm free. I'm coming. Because you'll get bored at home. And anyway, there's no cost here. So there's free. Doors are open for you. Anywhere else you go, you have to pay to enter. That's why we keep the doors open, you know. It's very easy to come. I'm not saying everybody sitting here has come with that attitude. But if you want to achieve something, you got to be fired by an ideal. This knowledge has come down for generations. How is it available to us here, comfortably sitting in a classroom? The masters, the students were in the Himalayan jungles fighting all, when we say that, all sorts of discomforts. There could be animals, there could be disturbances, there, uh, there are no comfortable seats, nothing, sitting on the floor. How much they must have struggled and they took the pains to pass it down to the next generation and the next generation. 5,000 years have gone. You know, we take it for granted. But to understand that this knowledge has been made available to you today itself should put you on fire. It should. And then what do I have benefited from this? How do I contribute? What must I do to give back? That is an ideal that you set for yourself. Let me improve myself. A simple ideal which will change your life completely. You can move from where you are to something extraordinary if you are committed genuinely to this purpose of life. Then you are yuktaha, self-controlled. But a, a yuktaha, a person who has no such purpose, what happens to such a per person? No knowledge. Like the doctor who is mechanically dishing out his knowledge with no ideal, 
See, he doesn't understand. I must be an example for others to follow. I'm a doctor. I'm representing the physical health. I must maintain physical health. People should look up to me. He himself should observe all those principles. Then he'll be outstanding. Any field for that matter, whatever you do, even if you're doing business, what sort of business are you doing? You're doing business to help people, to give them a good product. Or you could say, this product is not available, so whatever I give, people have to take it, even if it's substandard. Even in business, you could have an ideal. Today, the, the management term that is being used is sustainability. What is the sustainability? You make mistakes and then try to rectify it. Corporate social responsibility. You better start thinking of people. You're compulsory. A percentage has to be given to society. Until then, you don't think. So something is enforced, and then you do it. It still doesn't have the impact. You're doing it under pressure, not out of choice. When you have an ideal, automatically you think of everything. Nobody has to force it down your throat. The whole world is going through this. You have to do, because you choose or you're blind to things that are around you. Here is a subject that makes you think of everything that you ought to do in life and do it well, not because you are forced to do something. So that is a yukta purusha. But a person who is, doesn't have this ideal, he doesn't have knowledge nor meditation. Now in the context, meditation is the ability, relatively speaking, it's the ability to reflect to think, to understand. But in the ultimate sense, you qualify to meditate and realize. See, in the Gita, every verse can be read in two tongues. One is the ultimate state of perfection. And if you believe you're nowhere there, then relatively speaking, wherever you are, you got to lead a life of values. So when you are able to think and reflect, you have that bhavana, that meditative attitude in life, re reflective attitude in life, contemplative attitude in life. You're able to think, reason at all times. If you are a yukta purusha, you'll be able to think, reason all the time. If you don't have a goal, then you are unsteady, you are not meditative, you're not reflective, you don't have knowledge, knowledge in the true sense of the term, you don't live up to these principles in life. For such a person, an unmeditative person, there cannot be peace. And to the peaceless, there cannot be happiness. So this is the reason why people are not happy. So the next time you are unhappy, don't point to the world, try and look within. There's a beautiful poem. It's called The Turkey and the Ant. I think it's the very first poem in the book of po poems that we have. Select English poems. And there he gives the story of the turkey and the ant. The message there is how difficult it is for us to understand our own faults. It is so easy for us to point our fingers to the world. And however justified, it may be a fact what you're saying, but what you are doing is far more serious. You don't even know that. That's the story of the turkey and the ant. See, the turkey was eating ants, a whole hill of ants for a breakfast, right? Finishing a nation of ants. And it was cursing man. Christmas is around the corner. It was cursing man. Man cursed man on turkeys, prey, and Christmas shortens all our days. So it is a fact that man is cursed for killing the turkey and having it on Christmas. But 
Turkey doesn't understand for one breakfast you're finishing off a nation of ants. You're killing so many ants. You don't see it. But you can easily see what a human is doing, which is a fact. That's how an ant that climbed beyond her reach, thus answered from a neighboring beach, uh, means a branch. Ere you remark another sin, bid thine own conscience look within, control thy more voracious bill, nor for a breakfast nations kill. Before you remark another sin, look within. What are you doing? You're talking about a human, which is correct. But what are you doing? You're finishing one nation of ants for a breakfast. You don't worry about the turkey or the ant. That's not the message. The message here is, any time you point your finger at somebody else's fault, you are doing something at that time which is far more serious than what you're pointing out to. This is being meditative. This is being reflective. This is being contemplative. If you live a life of reflection, thinking, understanding, you will find peace in life. If you point your finger at others and justify, you will be miserable. You will be unhappy. That's what he's saying. To the peaceless, how can there be any happiness? Next verse. Indriyanam hi charatam Yanmanonu vidhiyate Tadasya harate pragnyam Vayurnavami vambhasi for the mind which follows the roving senses carries away his intellect as the wind carries away a boat on water. Now this is a very famous you know, uh, metaphor that he gives. He talks about the boat on water. Throughout our Shastras, this example is given of a boat uh, on water or in the ocean. The human personality is compared to the boat and the waters is the world that we live in, the experiences that we have in life. Now what he's saying is, before we get to that example, you must get the flow of thought. In the 60th verse, he said, the turbulent senses of even a wise striving on the path carries away the mind. That's what we saw in the 60th verse. Forcibly carries away the mind. That's what he said. And then from verse 61 until 66, he talks about the importance of controlling the senses with the help of the intellect. How do you control the senses? Only the intellect can do it. Six verses have been spent which we just concluded 66th, where he talks about the importance of using the intellect. I've almost monotonously repeated to you all, a book has been written only for this purpose, to show us how our intellect has fallen. See, as you sit here, the intellect has fallen. Then you may say, why are we here then, if the intellect has fallen? A fragment of the intellect is still available. That brings you here. You could have chosen not to come. But something has pushed you. I should do this. Whether it's convenient or not. Whether I like it or not. Some little fragment of intellect has brought you here. So you can congratulate yourself. That there is something in me. But it will die. It's like a spark. The spark has to bring about a flame. You've got to preserve it. You've got to encourage it. You've got to nurture and nourish it, feed it. Then it will pick up. Once it picks up, your life is made. But if you permit the spark to die away, you will go back exactly where you belong. Nothing will happen to you except you have spent a few evenings here. This is a fact. I have to be honest to you. So, the intellect has already fallen. But you can pick it up. 
just as how many of us here in this classroom, if I were to ask each one, how many of us can claim to be fit physically? I bring back the body all the time because it's easy for you to understand. You can weigh yourself, you can look at yourself in the mirror and see what is your shape, what is your size. It's easy. You know you are overweight, you know you have not attended to the body, you know you need to knock off, you know you need to strengthen, but what are you doing about it? Nothing. And you expect to live a full life without physical problems? It's a question of time. Reach your past, your middle ages, it'll start. One by one problems will start and then you'll keep running to the doctor. Rest of your life is only going to the doctor. Appointments, which doctor, a physiotherapist, or a heart specialist, a diabetologist, or the thing, a pathologist, that's all your life. Why do you do this to yourself? You don't have to. But the intellect is not available even to look after your body. How can it look after anything else? That's why we are saying you got to help yourself by yourself. Same Bhagavad Gita says, Udharet Atmana Atmanam. You got to lift yourself by yourself. Nobody can help you. You got to apply yourself. And it's not difficult. Just a little bit of effort. Like, you know, you take, don't you all take insurance? Huh? Why do you take insurance? Already you need more money, but you say, no, 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 I'll set aside something. Why? I've got a new car. I've got a new house. I have to ensure my life. So you set aside certain monies because you believe it is important to protect that which is precious to you. You set aside. If you had that money, you could have done something else. But you feel the pinch. It's, it hurts you, but you keep on you know, paying. The, that installment, whatever you have to pay, because you're building something, your insurance money. Why do you do it? Should something go wrong, you can fall back on that insurance. You're protected, you're well protected. What are you doing about insuring your peace, your happiness? There is no insurance you're paying, nothing you're doing. So what are we saying? A little bit of knowledge. Yes, you don't have time at all. You're a very busy person. It is a pinch on your time. It is a pinch on your effort. It is not easy. But if you understand the importance of this effort, you will set aside that time and a little effort. That's all you need to do. You build an insurance. You insure yourself against all problems, all challenges in life. So, the intellect has been given so much importance for six verses. He's explained it, which we've already gone through. And now he brings the link back. The turbulent senses of a wise person carries away his mind. For the mind which follows the roving senses carries away the intellect as wind, a boat on water. So now, imagine... You've, you've heard of that game tug of war? You have two uh, teams and they hold a rope. Now each team, one stands be next to the other, behind the other, and each team is trying to pull the other team towards them. Tug of war. So one side, imagine it's the world and all the sense objects. So many things the world is offering you, so tantalizing, so attractive. That is the world. Objects of the senses, it's pulling you on one side. Now you, the individual, you're standing here. First is your senses. Eyes, ears, nose, tongue, skin. That's the first person standing. Behind the senses is the mind. I like this, I don't like this, I want this, I don't want this, the demands, desires, right behind the senses, holding the rope. Behind the mind is the intellect. And that's your whole personality. 
Now this is the tug of war going on. The world is pulling you on one side. You got to be strong and hold this side. But he's saying the senses, see these, this side they're all African Americans standing. World and the sense objects. This side is all South Indians. <laughs> Not even North India. Not even Punjabis, you know, solid fellows. All the weak fellows standing here. With a dhoti, they are standing. <laughs> Thin fellows, only eating uh, curd rice. Nothing else they've eaten. These fellows eat anything except human beings. They've eaten everything. <laughs> solid fellows. This is the position now. Now, if one pull they give, the whole lot will go this side. Just a tug they have to give. Nothing more. All that we are saying is, as it is, the senses are weak. And the mind behind has no strength. Intellect is sleeping. What chance do you have? That's what he's saying. The senses are turbulent. Mind has got weaknesses. Intellect is not strong. How do you survive? It's a miracle. It's really a miracle how you survive. Somehow or the other, you go through life. But if you want to lead a sensible life, the intellect becomes strong. Once the intellect becomes strong, it disciplines the mind and senses. You have the whole thing under control. Nothing can pull you away. So if you don't follow these disciplines, he says, your intellect is carried away as the wind. Wind is compared to the passions of the mind. And the boat is your personality. See, a boat has a compass and a captain. So the compass is the shastras, the knowledge. The knowledge that is given to you always points the right direction. This is the way to go. So you use the compass. What uses the compass? The intellect, the captain. And it guides your personality to the shore of immortality through the ocean of this experiences that you have. But if the captain is not there and there's no reference to a compass, the boat is tossed in this waves and it can capsize. You're lost, you're finished, you're destroyed. So it is important that the intellect is alert, the captain is alert and is using the compass, the shastras, and then you can go on a cruise, the same ocean. You can go on a cruise and enjoy and reach your destination. But if you don't have a wise captain and you're not following the shastras, the compass, you are left to the violent winds of experiences only to capsize and destroy yourself. Next verse. Tasma dhyasya mahabaho Nigrihitani sarvashah Indriyani indriyarthebhyah Tasya pragnya pratishthita Therefore, O Mahabaho, his wisdom is established whose senses are completely restrained from sense objects. You see how many times he has repeated. Senses have to be restrained, controlled. Not denied, controlled. At least in this classroom, by now, you should know the difference between self-denial and self-control. World of difference between the two. It, uh, it happens even in our country. See, there are practices that we have. They take vows. People take vows. 40 days, I will not do this. I will not do that. I will restrain myself. Uh, and it's a torturous life for 40 days. Why? Because I have to go to the temple. So you take the vow out of your own free will. And since it is not, see, if it is a self-discipline, you will not feel any problem with that at all. In fact, you don't need 40 days. Throughout the year, you are disciplined. It's not a strain on you at all. But if you are leading an indulgent life, indisciplined life, and then you say, at least 40 days, I must be disciplined. I'm talking about such people. They constrain themselves. They restrain themselves. 
and frustrate themselves. People who have non-vegetarian, people who smoke, people who drink, they give up all that and they're used to using fine clothes. They wear ordinary clothes, don't even wear footwear, chappals, they go about everywhere. It is a tapas, they do for 40 days. So much frustration must be building up because the moment the person finishes the darshan in the temple, 40 days are over, he's gone there with a the mobile. He immediately calls his wife, we are reaching by 7 o'clock. We finish the puja immediately after that, prepare all the non-vegetarian, keep my drinks ready, keep the food, cigarette packet. He will, he will indulge in all that he missed these 40 days, more than what he would have normally done. Now you've got to ask yourself, why are you torturing yourself? For what? There is no purpose. You have not gained anything. You have not progressed. You have avoided something and made up for what you have missed. Without mentioning, I'm only saying, for you to think, you can find out the statistics for yourself. There is a period of time in certain religions where they fast. So almost every religion has that. The statistics that we found out is the fasting months, the food is sold most. It's a fact. You find out. The fasting month, food is sold most. Now, how it is consumed, I don't know. But this is statistics. You, this is, a, again, an analysis, not a criticism. It's an analysis. Why are, what is the meaning of this? Why are people doing it? What ought to be done? You got to think for yourself. That is why almost monotonously he has repeated and he has concluded in this verse, tasmat. Remember we said the Bhagavad Gita is a scientific exposition. It's a systematic knowledge that tells you what you should do, why you should do, reasons, logic is given. And having given all the reason, all the logic, he says tasmat. Therefore, conclusion, QED. What? O Mahabaho, O mighty armed one, you're a soldier, you've got strength, you've got valor, you ought to fight this challenge. Of what? Your own senses. His wisdom is established whose senses are completely restrained from sense objects, who has that control over his experiences in the world. Yanisha sarva bhutanam tasyam jagarti samyami yasyam jagrati bhutani sanisha pasyato munehe that which is night to all beings, therein the self-controlled one keeps awake. That in which beings are awake is night to the sage who sees. Now this is a staggering statement. It's a, a wake-up call, as it were, because he's giving us an important message. It's coming. Now what happens is the experiences of the ignorant is what he's talking about. What is day to the ignorant people? What is comfortable for the ignorant person is uncomfortable for a sage of wisdom, for a wise person. See, to indulge in the senses, the ignorant are comfortable. Let's have more. Let's go ahead. Why are you restricting yourself? Come on. They talk about, they, when in, a, you know, uh, in the parties, how many drinks can one person have? It's an achievement. You take pride in the fact that you can take more and more and they challenge, have some more, have some more, till the fellow collapses. And that is your enjoyment. A fellow could not take beyond that point and he makes a fool of himself and all the others enjoy that. This is what he's saying. Indiscriminate enjoyment. You lose your dignity. Yet you will do it. Why do you do that? 
you what is day to you is night to the wise person wise person says, excuse me that's enough i will not have even if you're having a drink you know your limits you call the shots why are you slave to all this or a young fellow may say you know new year's what i'm planning i'm i'm going to ride on a bike in the main street in pune on the wrong side when there's traffic i'm planning to do that and unnecessarily i'm giving ideas i hope nobody takes it up <laughs> please ha ah, good idea we never thought of that <laughs> people believe that is an achievement defy defy do something daring see if you are a person of courage the most daring thing is to hold your own ego your own desire if you are able to hold it hats off you are a complete slave to what to your own body the tongue you are a slave that we told about viveka chudamani any weakness for one sense organ can destroy you one sense we've got weakness for all the five and we call ourselves brave achievers what have you achieved you have achieved a way by which you can completely destroy yourself that's what you have achieved in a lifetime every temptation you succumb this is our life and we take pride in the fact that we can do it what happens to people see you le- read the life of celebrities they have achieved something they great entertainers but their personal lives are miserable miserable because there's no control who can stop them the stats i don't know if you have it here very interesting stats you can google and find out for yourself see in the west the divorce rates are very high india we are catching up with the west we still have to become westernized urban india is already cat- caught up rural india still has cultural values we have not yet reached that state but it's a question of time with all this globalization we will pick up all the wrong things they have some wonderful traits they're very dynamic they have great value for cleanliness they're punctual all that we will not imitate but if they divorce we will divorce here they have valentines day we will have valentines day what is that valentines day nobody understands simply mimic the west with no idea no purpose just a weakness herd instinct they are all doing we also must do so the divorce rate there first marriage is about ah here you have it first marriage 45 to 50% marriages end in divorce west us second marriage is 60 to 67% second marriages and third marriage is 70 to 73 this is the achievement western achievement. Uh, again we are not criticizing please uh, don't go and say we are indians we have good marriages what constant fighting <laughs> here you suffer and live together there they say why should we suffer let's part ways but nobody is satisfied with the husband it they say every mother believes that the daughter should find a better husband than she did <laughs> and the mother is convinced that the son will never find a wife like his father did <laughs> you are great everybody else is wrong and indian male will say chalo yaar let her think whatever she wants he doesn't fight back therefore the marriage is continue <laughs> you suffer each other this is called titiksha titiksha is an indian quality indian quality titiksha means the capacity to suffer happily <laughs> so when guests come into your home it's a suffering the lady has to work hard and all that but uh, you keep on inviting keep on suffering and happily suffer it's a unique indian quality no westerner can have it even if the parents come sorry mom 
I'm busy this weekend, try next weekend. That's it. They, they can't adjust. But we will adjust, we will move out of our rooms, we'll sleep on the floor and after they're all gone, all of us will suffer and talk. Why did you call? Why did I call? All that will happen, but you suffer. <laughs> that is the tiksha. Happily, you'll suffer. So, what is your sense of achievement? What have you achieved? Is it worth anything? What you believe is an achievement, why say you're wasting your time? What is night to all beings? There in the self-controlled keeps awake. To lead a life of discipline, to lead a life of principles, to lead a life of self-control, a wise is comfortable. But an ignorant will say, what a terrible life. You people wake up at four o'clock? Terrible, terrible, terrible. And you sleep early? How boring. It's, a, it's night to you, terrible to you. What is a sensible way of living? And you live a long, fulfilled life, a life of accomplishment. That seems terrible. But to indulge, to lose your body, to lose your mind in agitation, that seems wonderful. What is day to you is night to the self-control. What is night to the self-control is day to you. You're comfortable in that. That's what he's saying. That which is night to all beings. There in the self-control keeps awake. That in which beings are awake, where all the indulgent people are enjoying and they say, this is life, this is life. It is night to the sage. Sage says, no, I won't do that. So relatively speaking, if you are a disciplined person, you will avoid anything that, will, that is detrimental to your well-being. It's not only food habits, sleeping, waking, we're not talking about that. Even the way you feel. See, Shakespeare says, jealousy is a green-eyed monster. It mocks the flesh it preys on. See, people entertain negative thoughts because it's very, en it, it, is, it, helps, it helps you to enjoy. You encourage negative thoughts. See, if you talk ill about a person, 10 people are ready to do And then what happened? <laughs> ready there, you got audience. Why? You got all this juicy information. Anything that brings down somebody, you have audience. Why is it? Why is it that people enjoy another's downfall? Something, a criticism. Why? Because it's entertaining. That is what Shakespeare says. Whether it is jealousy or greed or anger. You know, even when you have a wound and it is still not healed, you want to scratch it. Ah, such a pleasure to scratch that wound. You can't resist it. You feel so itchy. But you know you're hurting yourself. You're aggravating it. But you can't resist the temptation of uh, scratching a wound. It's like that. A jealousy is a green-eyed monster. monster. It's like this crocodile. Green-eyed monster means he's talking about a crocodile. You know, sometimes when they are bred in captivity, the time tourists or people come to watch is when they feed. How they feed these reptiles. So you find in a large pit, many crocodiles are there. And they let loose live rodents, you know, the big bandigoods, the big rodents, rats, big ones. They're running all over the place, big fellows. And um, this crocodile doesn't move. It's got its jaws wide open, it's basking in the sun, lazy creatures as it were, you know. Everything, food is there available. Why does it have to work for anything, right? So it's got its jaws wide open. These rodents, these rats, they go into the jaw and come out running, go over it. They're running all over the place because they're running everywhere. The crocodile doesn't do anything. It just keeps its jaws open. Suddenly when the rodent is there, it closes its jaws and eats it up unannounced. It happens suddenly. So Shakespeare has observed that and put it to us that 
the any negative emotion is like that crocodile it mocks the flesh it preys on it is going to eat it up but it is entertaining it as it were playing with it as it were just that feeling you get ah such a nice feeling to scratch your wound you can't resist it because it gives you pleasure you don't understand you are worsening the situation you are hurting yourself you are harming yourself you can't resist that is how any negative emotion works so it is not only physical habits even mentally to say no let's not talk about another why talk ill about another if at all you have to talk talk something positive why because everyone is made up of good and bad right and wrong nobody is free why not talk and associate with the good of another and yes there is something bad avoid it it's like a pit you see a pit you avoid the pit why must you fall into the pit and then curse it keep away like we talked about animals animals have certain qualities if you know this is a dangerous animal you admire it for what it is but keep a distance similarly with people if you learn to do that you have no issues with your experiences in the world with your relationships in the world so that is the way to go a wise person functions in the world with this understanding and keeps away from anything that is going to bring him down bring down his dignity bring down his peace of mind anything that is negative आपूर्यमाणमचल प्रतिष्ठम समुद्रमाप प्रविशन्ति यद्वत् तद्वत् कामायम प्रविशन्ति सर्वे सशांति माप्नोति न कामकामी अ वेरी फेमस वर्स ऑफ कोटेड as the waters enter the ocean which filled from all sides remains undisturbed likewise he in whom all objects of enjoyment enter attains peace not the desirer of objects so two types of people he is referring to here he says kama kami Kama kami is one who has plenty of desires and he's constantly trying to fulfill the desires that is his mission in life i've got desires he he says this look i have only one life let me go all out and enjoy life fully i want to satisfy all my desires so his mission in life is to enjoy to fulfill his desires but the question is does he fulfill them does he enjoy life so here he says saha a person who has led a life of principles a life of self control saha he is ever peaceful not a kamakami not a person who is running after desires trying to satisfy them he can never be happy he can never be fulfilled and that's what we were referring to all the so called celebrities all the young people are looking up to them oh either it is hollywood stars or bollywood stars that is all our idols in life whatever they do we must do then you will end up like them the celebrity marriages is a, again i am not going into the details they have there are many no names i'm not even bringing it up the so called celebrities they have not lasted one year and some have la- lasted few hours but they are going fulfilling desires that is what they're doing they like somebody it's not arranged marriage then they ask what is this arranged marriage how do you fellows marry somebody you don't know that is why it has lasted when you know it doesn't last like the fellow one day the husband the wife found the husband missing 
middle of the night so she's wondering what happened to this fellow where is he gone so she went looking for him he was sitting in the the pantry you know the kitchen the table there drinking a cup of coffee middle of the night she said what happened what are you doing here i was thinking 20 years back you remember you were 18 i was also very young and we were in the park where we always used to meet the wife was so happy the fellow was thinking of the 20 years of marriage so she also sat down with him yes i also remember she very happy your father caught us in the park do you remember that I said yes yes i remember he caught us and then he put the gun to my head and said either you marry my daughter or i'll put you in jail for 20 years I said yes i remember i'm thinking i would have been released today not the kama kami he tried to satisfy his desire 20 years he has suffered that's all he has to think so he is saying a wise person saha saha is one who has led a sensible life a life of self control life of principles such a person he says what happens all the experiences of the world he absorbs never disturbed and the comparison is to an ocean an ocean is nothing but a vast sheet of water it has achieved a state of paripurna represents that state you know we started today's class saying you are worth that state you are heir to that state of paripurna that is your divine nature your original stature you're far from that now because we have not yet set the direction but you can reach that direction you ought to get there that is your original state that state of paripurna so what happens to the ocean millions and millions of gallons of water flow into the ocean but it doesn't make any difference to it it just absorbs and doesn't change so if you say look here is a person who nothing makes a difference to him he is not in a state of paripurna he could be in extreme tamas fellow who can't understand enjoyment who has no capacity to enjoy who has no resources to enjoy such a person he, uh, he doesn't want anything in life has no meaning but if you have the capacity to earn you have the capacity to procure you have objects of the world to enjoy and you enjoy it with self control see it's like you must have appetite first of all you must have an appetite you must be a healthy person you can eat and enjoy food plenty of food is there before you and you are eating the food and enjoying it but you know when to say enough usually if you can eat you eat more than necessary you pay money go to a restaurant ha huh? pay through your nose you go in happy smiling you come out saying i oh, i don't know why i ate so much you paid money to have a stom- stomach ache and you call it enjoyment so the moment you have the capacity you misuse it abuse it lose the enjoyment all he saying is saha who is a sensible person he has the capacity he has the resources he has access to the objects he enjoys the objects calls it a day complete control that person he says all the experiences of the world reach him he enjoys the world but nothing can disturb his peace of mind no excitement no dejection perfectly peace and tranquil vihaya kamanya sarvan pumam charati nispraha nirmamo nirahankara sa shanti madhi gachhati that man saha 
who abandons all desires and moves about without yearning, without sense of I and mine, he attains peace. So you remember in the beginning, he asked, how do you describe that person, person of steady wisdom? How does that infinite truth express through this finite human? How does that happen? Vihaya Kaman Sarvan. All desires are abandoned. So when you act in this world, you have desires, yes. But why do you act? How do you act in this world? Because this is what you ought to do. You get your best lessons from nature. Remember we talked about the rose that gives fragrance. It doesn't choose. Oh, the mistress has come. I will give fragrance. Uh, Mali has come. Uh, don't waste time. No, it will give fragrance at all times, even if it is alone. If nobody is appreciating its fragrance, it will still give fragrance. You can take that rose and keep it in your lounge and ten people are appreciating that rose. It will still give the same fragrance. It makes no difference to that rose. Whether you recognize it or not recognize it. Whether you give it position or don't give it any position. Whether it's in company or alone, it will never move away from what it ought to do. So, Vihaya Kaman Sarvan. So everything that you do in life is what you ought to do. Yaha Puman Charati. See, Charati is a beautiful word that indicates you're a dynamic person. You're full of energy. Till the last day of your life, you should constantly function in this world effectively. Not as a nuisance, not as a burden to your family. You got, see, if you lead a life of self-control, you can live a full life, a complete life, a sensible life. Yaha Puman, which the person, Charati, who is moving. You move about in this world, three conditions. Nispruhaha, no desires driving your actions. There are no desires gurgling. Abandons all desires. Nirahankaraha. Without the sense of agency. I am doing this. And since I have done it, this is mine. It belongs to me. The family belongs to me. This business belongs to me. That claim. It's, then you need not say, oh, you said the business does not belong. I wrote it off to my son-in-law. A fellow will walk out with your daughter and the business and never see you again. So don't blame Vedanta, don't blame Bhagavad Gita. It doesn't mean you should give up your possessions. It means you need to give up the possessiveness in the possessions. What is yours? What do you claim? My son is mine. You have done nothing to produce that son. It all happened beyond your control. But when the son is born, you claim, this is mine. You better look after me. I will bring you up, but you have to take care of me. That expectation ruins the relationship. But the same taking care, the same caring, everything you do without that possessiveness, without that claiming, I, this is me, I have done it for you. You belong to me. You lose it all. So, nirahankaraha. Nir mama, there is no minus, there is no possessiveness. If you function in this world without these feelings, you will attain peace in whatever you do. Esha Brahmi Stiti Partha Nainam Prapya Vimuhyati Stritvasya Mantaka Lepi this is the state of Brahman, O Partha. Attaining this, none is deluded. Being established therein, even at the end of life, one attains oneness with Brahman. Now he's already stated that 
when you get to the state, the state of that ocean, where it can receive all the rivers without being affected. See, what is interesting is every river has to reach the ocean. That is its destination. Now, the river can take a right royal path and reach the ocean quickly. Or it can take a long winding route. But the river cannot stop moving till it reaches its destination. That is its goal, to reach the ocean. Similarly, you are a human. You are not an animal. You are not a plant. You are a human. You are born into this world to find out your essential nature. But if you forego this opportunity called life to be lost in desires, punarapi jananam, punarapi maranam, punarapi janani, jatare shayanam, you will just go through the cycle of birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. You don't know how many times you've already gone through it. Some people say, I don't believe in birth and death. I don't believe in reincarnation. Don't believe. Think, from where did you come? You're born into this world. How did you come? From where? One day you go. Where are you going? You simply ignore both. So there is a chapter that talks about the theory of reincarnation. There's perfect logic reason. To put it briefly, the sages only audited accounts. That's all they did. What they said is, sudden expression of qualities at birth. Distinct qualities. One baby has, is crying all the time. Another baby is laughing all the time. Third baby is sleeping all the time. Each one has a distinct quality. Fourth baby is playing about, playing about. All the time is doing something. Playing, 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 playing. From where did the babies get the qualities? From where did it come? Question mark. We don't know. At death, whenever death occurs, it could be young age, it could be old age, it could be middle age, it could be any age. Whenever death occurs, it's not that a person says, I've had a wonderful life, I've lived a full life, thank you very much, goodbye, I'm dying. No. There's so many thoughts so many desires, so many wishes, so many demands, suddenly gone. Where have they gone? We don't know. Question mark. So these sages only connected the two. They say, these unfulfilled desires have to find fulfillment somewhere. Death of this person is connected to birth of the child. That is why you find a sudden expression of qualities. And this is how they proposed the theory of reincarnation. Why theory? Because it cannot be proved. But the theory is based on the law of causation. Every cause has an effect. Birth is an effect. What is the cause? Death is a cause. What is the effect? They connected the two and proposed the theory of reincarnation. So he says, even at the end of life, one attains one, oneness with Brahman. You can attain that oneness, that self-realization, by this lifetime. One is you give up the body and reach the highest after death. But even while you live, you can achieve the highest experience, and that is the life of self-realized souls. See, each enlightened person lived a particular life. Each one is different. One great soul sang and sang the praises of the Lord. Another enlightened person electrified audiences. A third enlightened person kept quiet, silence, never spoke a word. But they're all expressions of the same enlightenment. Why are they all different? Because their vasanas were different. Their original vasanas were different.
And that's how the expressions are different. This state of Brahman, this is the state of Brahman. You get back to your original state. Attaining this, none is deluded. Once you get that state, you will never be deluded. You reach a state of perfection. You remember we talked about that graph of perfection? At 100th point, you attain enlightenment. So you will never be deluded thereafter, being established therein. Om Tat Sat Iti Shreemad Bhagavad Gita Supanishadsu Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastre Shri Krishna Arjuna Samvade Sankhya Yogo Nama Dviti Yodhyayaha we will read the verse we started with this session so that we have the humility to believe that we have not concluded our study, but we shall dedicate ourselves to the study of the scripture. Verse 45, please. Traigunya vishaya vedaha Nistraigunyo bhavarjuna Nirdvandvo nitya sattvastaha Niryoga kshema atmavan Thank you very much.